outside of a convention, and it's very, very different depending on even which venue you're doing outside of a convention, whether it's a fur event at the bowling, or whether it's something at the more, say, the, I guess it gets all public, but things like a charity walk or charity run or other events like that. Um, so for anybody who has done outside of a con before, I mean, what are some of the things that you experienced? Well, I'm still really new at this. Okay. My own first suit is still coming here in a few months. But I'm from the, in the Bay Area, San Francisco area, there's a lot of other events oh, yeah. or furs where you can be not at a con, like yes. at a bowling alley or there's a party that's held once a month. So I've been in other people's first suits briefly during yep. that time. Well, it's been actually, so there are a few communities in the U.S., actually even Seattle, I think it's definitely one of them as well, but there's enough of a local kind of uh, critical mass that you can go out and do things like that. And I, I know you said this is first student in public, but I, I seem yep. to recall, correct me if I have it wrong, are you also going to talk about first student skills, like how to move in a first student? I don't know if it's this one, there's, there's one at one o'clock, which I think is character for your character. Yeah, which I think yes, is the that's one o'clock one. one is character. Yeah, so it's, we'll do performance at one, I'll probably even come back in soon for that one, and talk and say what you shouldn't do, but I will anyway. Uh, but we can talk about some of that stuff now, too, uh, because I think a lot of that actually does kind of lead into it, because how you perform at a con is very different than how you perform in public. I think that a lot of people maybe don't recognize that. Um, certainly at a convention, you have the luxury of people who are, well, I, you know, I say luxury and curse. It's a luxury because people are okay with fursuits, mostly, and so you get the opportunity to not have to worry about creeping people out. The other side, though, is people are so used to fursuits, there's no real novelty to it. And so there's actually, no magic for them. There really isn't. There, I mean, like, there is, because I get excited every time I see a fursuit, and, yeah. like, no matter how many times I see them, yep. but that's not the same for everybody. You know? No, and I tell you, the reaction you get from, from kids or parents out in public, if you were one of a handful Wait. of suitors, is, is yeah. I think it's a lot better. Well, there's been but, some parents who actually brought their kids to the con, and yep. that's been so much fun. Like, there was this little boy with a mohawk, and he and his sister, like, high-fived me, and I said, no, well, so, it, was, it was really cute. It was was really anybody at Anthrocon this past year? So Anthrocon, obviously gigantic con, um, fantastically positive relationship with the city of Pittsburgh. Um, and I give them full kudos for that. They've done a great job involving the community to the point where the local city people will actually come in and buy day memberships and their kids and whatnot will go through the con. They'll be walking around during the parade and there will be just reams of children who have just come in to watch because it's this that's, huge event. That's really fun because it's like a day event for the kids to kind of come in. Well, that's it's exactly really it. Good. And it, it's a great opportunity for anybody who's learning to pursue that, you know, you can learn the con where people are more forgiving, but you also have that ability to experience it with other people. The tougher side. Well, they're, they're tougher. They're, they're easier to please because <laughs> a lot of folks outside of the convention aren't used to that. So you don't have to be as on the ball. You have to be watching other things, of course. You want to make sure that you're safe, that you're hydrated, that you're not knocking kids over, you're not going to have that same problem the, inside the con itself. Um, but yeah, you, the trade-off, of course, is that they're easily amused, so that's the thing. Yeah, anyway, the big problem I have is when I'm always around kids is this. Oh, like people want to pull the tail. Yes, they do. Um, you're going to get a lot of that. So that, actually, the first thing that I typically recommend, if anybody is first-timing outside of a con, even if you're not... I, I see some, some fairly good veterans out there get into trouble. You want to make sure you've got a spotter, always. In a con, it's not necessarily as important. Um, in, fact, in fact, probably most people don't because everybody's sort of a pseudo spotter just by way of being at a con. Um, but when you're in public, the things I always recommend to people, first and foremost, know your exits. Always survey the area where you're going to be. Make sure whoever event you're going to knows you're going to be there and what you're doing. Um, I'm not a big fan of just showing up in a suit because we live in a very weird world now, and maybe we did 10, 15 years ago where you could maybe just show up and soon people would go odd and then go about their business. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of places where people will see you and they don't know what you are. They really don't. You know, you could be curious, you could be this, you could be that, you could be, and obviously we're very benign, but people don't know that. Um, I was at, actually up in Vancouver a few years ago um, at Halloween time, and somebody was in a suit and thought they would mess around on Granville Street with some of the police officers. Oh, cool. But they weren't they weren't being vicious, but at, again, to a furry, it's like, oh, cute little dog's doing something. But again, to a cop, you're a dude that they can't see and don't know, and they don't know your intentions, and so as cute as you may or may not look... You're going to spend the night with everything. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, or worse, potentially. So again, you need to know your surroundings, know your exits, always survey the areas, make sure you've got spotters. Um, the ratio, again, of spotters to performers depends, I would argue, on the venue. Um, 
I've been to bowling events. Actually, I live in Chicago, and we have a, a pretty decent-sized community. We do a bowling thing every month. Um, and again, it's a closed space where you don't have to worry about a lot of that stuff. But even still, you need a few folks who aren't in suit because you get the random crowd that comes in that may be drinking and could potentially cause problems. So you get the kids who want to pull tails, but then you get the, the drunk adults who also like to pull tails. <laughs> so, it's like convention space. You pretty got, you've got free reign to do whatever you want within reason. Now you're not going to hurt each other. Exactly. But you people will be a little bit more exaggerated. And again, depending on your public event, that may differ as well. Because when you're in public in a, a walk or out in open in a, a space, you do want to exaggerate a lot of your movements. So when you're walking, you're walking big. Your character is big. Um, the flip side, though, is when you're at a public event that's maybe indoors, you don't want to be as big. Because you'll knock things over. You may not have the visibility and the vision. That's the other thing that a spotter is going to do is because, of course, when you're performing in public, most people's eye line is like here, and most kids are down here. And little kids don't appreciate it. They don't. No, they don't. They sneak up behind you and sneak up under you. They're, they're, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. And that's one of the challenges, of course, in public, is that you just don't have that line of vision. And we've been in, I did a lot of public events when I was up in Canada, and I've done a few since I'm in the U.S. Um, and you're always going to get that opportunity to kind of walk around and end up bumping somebody because there's a kid down there and you just can't see. And a lot of the parents and a lot of folks who have not worn these costumes don't understand that we don't see. And so they'll send their kid up, go oh, give him a hug, and you're just looking around like this, all of a sudden it's crunch. It's like, oh, that's someone's arm or something. I just, you got to be careful with that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of folks who do public appearances, I, I think, a lot of people I talk to anyway, their goal is to do things like, let's go to a hospital, or let's do things like that, let's go to these types of events. And those are very, very different um, for a number of reasons. Um, the bigger ones, obviously, is you in a physical hospital. If you can actually get the opportunity to go in, um, you have to be very careful because a lot of things you can bump into, a lot of things you can um, run into, but things more like walks, things more like runs, fun runs, that kind of stuff, those, those fundraisers, you get a little bit more free reign. You still get the ability to kind of exercise your skills and, and try to get people interested without the worry of maybe knocking over something expensive or hurting something. So... Um, let's see here. You've done a bunch of public stuff. What are some of the what are you, some of the things you consider you worry about? This is Orwin, by the way. Um, people like to climb on you. That's true. They, they like to pull anything that isn't attached to you very well and try to run away with it. Mm -hmm. um, and they will try to pull your paws off, tails, yep. anything like that. So if you go out in public, make sure you are very well secure first. Yes. Yeah, and you make sure, yeah, you're, you're, as you extend the paw to shake or to give a high five or something that you're flying up to it inside as best you can. Um, I always recommend if you're in public, if, if somebody wants to hug you, for example, totally a good idea, no issues with that. Have them hug you, don't hug them. Um, what I mean by that is if, if you, you know, your kid comes over and wants to give you a hug, you just do the you know, get down to their level, because that's the first thing you typically want to do when you're in suit. If you're, six feet tall and the kid is not, you're most likely freaking most of them out by menacing over them because they're looking up at this giant thing. So you get down to their level, but have them come over to hug you. Um, and that's more, I don't say legal reasons or things like that, but there's always this, again, perception in public and in certain spaces. You don't want to be doing anything that could be deemed potentially um, overly physical. I'm trying to think of a nice way to say that. Um, but a lot of cases that's fine because the kids will come over and they'll hug you. Um, things like when, if you've ever seen characters at Disney or in the Six Flags Park or things like that, when they're in pictures. Search online, by the way, it's actually interesting because no one, no one who's had thought of this before has really kind of considered it. And then you start looking at some of these pictures and you go, oh yeah, right. Whenever these characters are in photos, their hands are always visible, both hands. Again, on purpose, so you don't come back later and say, yeah, Disney, Mickey broke me, or something like that, because you can't see the hand. So, again, I try as a good rule of thumb when you are having photos taken, hands visible, uh, when any type of contact is happening, have them hug you, and it, it's not the overwhelming embrace, it's the you know, nice pat thing. The kid will probably cling to you, and that's fine. The kid's coming to you, no problem. Um, let me see what else here. Some other examples of things. Any questions about any of that? Does that make sense? Yeah, for me, it's kind of simple. I never ever grab a kid. Yeah. It's always embrace them with the feathers. Yeah. 
it's, it's, it's a lot easier that way because there's no, there's no, I, I, yeah, most of us, in fact, I would hope all of us have, have the nicest of intentions and you don't want somebody else to misunderstand that, I guess, and that's the, the challenge. It, it can certainly go that way, given sort of the nature of where we are in this world today. Um, the other thing I run into, actually, in public, I've had this number of times when I was performing up in, in Vancouver, parents love their kids a lot, but they have no problem wanting to hand their baby to you and kind of hold them, and it's like, really? I can't see what I'm doing. You think I should be holding this? I don't know. I, my recommendation is I would never, ever, 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 ever grab a kid or puppies or things like that because, of course, we can't see and, and they don't bounce as well as we might want them to bounce. So, <laughs> but you're going to get that. Bouncing baby boy is just an expression. It is an expression, that's right, because I'm pretty sure they don't bounce. They cry a lot and then when they get older they get really angry and probably develop all sorts of weird And then they have psychosis. fears of first. That's right. Life. That's right. You're wrecking somebody's entire life. Um, but people, you do it enough, it's going to happen. It'll consistently happen. People go, oh, hold my baby, I want to get a picture. And typically, you know, again, as handlers or spotters are excellent for that because they can just say you know, no or, or they can assist the parent in helping wrangle them in the picture. But again, you don't want to be holding babies. Um, you want to make sure, of course, your hands are visible. You want to be nice. Um, hydration is more important. Those are the other things you're going to find when you're not at a con where you've got water everywhere. It's very easy, especially if you haven't been pursuing a lot, to suddenly forget that you need water or suddenly realize that you're really tired. So again, this comes back to that first recommendation of spotters, because spotters, again, have access to watches. If you, if you can find Thumper, he has a really good story about it. Yes. It's the first time he ever went. Yeah, so actually, yeah, there are a couple of them. So I remember there was the Rick Hansen walk that I actually ran in. I actually ran in five kilometers in pursuit for a charity run. How long? Awesome. How many hours? Um, I actually, I was one of the top finishers, oddly enough, in suit. But then I had heat stroke and almost spent the next day oh, yeah. dying yeah. because you just. Thumper was in suit 16 hours the first time. Yeah. He did he build a costume for himself for Halloween one year? Yep. And he was in suit for 16 hours. Came home and, was, and, and stayed in bed for like six, 36 hours because yeah. he was like dead. I did the same thing. After you, you, you don't know when you're in the thick of it how bad you are. It typically isn't until the day afterwards when you start to realize, wow, that was way too much. And it's not even just hydration. Hydration is very important, but it's the temperature. So you get you get overheated very, very quickly. So you want to make sure you're taking breaks. The spotter's helping you with that. You want to make sure you've got water. Um, if you're public events, it's tougher. Um, we, I would argue most furs are probably going to juggle with their first external event outside of a con with, I really want to do this versus I need to be safe doing this. And what I mean by that is, is sometimes in order to get an event, we are less likely, at least initially when we first start doing this, to probably push back and say, I need change space, I need you know room for spotters, or I need water. Because a lot of these events that want furs to come in unless you're doing a bowling event aren't going to recognize you need that. A lot of cases aren't going to have that stuff available. So, yeah, no, I'll come help with your charity walk, but I need somewhere to change, or but I need water. And a lot of them say, well, I don't have that. And so the, the first furs who start to do this, oh, well, no problem. Fine, whatever, we'll make it work. And eventually, we up in, in Vancouver bought a tent at Costco and created our own shelter space. Is that what they're using? Um, Helping paws, yeah. Paws? Yeah, and that was the idea, basically, we could never find way back in the day. When we were doing this, we never found change space, so we just said, well, we'll build our own change space, since we managed that ourselves. But that was one of the things that happened over time. Um, initially, and again, I'm guilty of this myself, is you just, yeah, I want to do this so bad, no problem. And it's just not worth it. You get a couple of problems that happen, you get a drunk teenagers, drunk adults, anybody like that that starts to cause problems. And if you don't know where you're going, you don't know your access, you don't have your spotters, you're dehydrated, that kind of stuff, it just, it's not pleasant. So. I don't know, I'm always in the air on the, uh, the side of safe rather than not because I have air on the side of not and I pay for it. So I have those, the battle scars maybe to kind of lead me in that other direction. It's good to find the expectations of the group that you're performing for before you get yeah, there. Absolutely. Well. You don't want someone who expects you to be out for three or four hours of time. <laughs> that's a very good point. And actually, that's, I think that they don't realize that. So. A lot of your event people if you're going to, again, sponsored events, have no concept at all. Um, and as long as you're polite about it, as long as, it's, if you come across knowing what you need and you're very, very nice and very clear about your expectations, they don't have a problem with it. And I think, again, if, if people get timid sometimes, if it's your first event, you just want to do it so bad, you don't want to maybe make them feel uncomfortable or, or tick them off, 
they'll oftentimes need to hear that, yeah, I can't be up for three hours at a shot, or yeah, I really do need to change space, or no, I can't change in the public restroom with everybody else, that kind of stuff. No, and you can just explain you don't remember the magic. It's probably a really good way to say you don't want to use the public restroom. Absolutely. Yeah, but you don't want to freak so, kids out, or yeah. also these things are kind of bulky, where am I going to do this in the bathroom? Yeah. Just going to stall, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm going to work. <laughs> You wouldn't want to stall wrapped in two mattresses and a, <laughs> you know, sheet. <laughs> wrapped in two mattresses, I like that, that's good. Well, that's what someone, when someone was talking about um, the, how they explain to people, yeah, no, we really don't, you know, get intimate in these things. It's like, would you want to, you know, do it with someone wrapped in two mattresses and with a pillow on your head? <laughs> yeah, that is, that's a good way of putting it, exactly. Yeah. Cause it gets and also, would you want to spend $2,000 and get stuff all over it? <laughs> that is true. That's actually a good way of looking at it. Because I always kind of had that same sort of expectation. Like, oh, you guys are good. Like, really? The physics seem to completely go against what you're saying. It's like you get, happen, it's so hot. Yeah. <laughs> Even in a partial. I mean, like, I have a head and paws that go up to here, and I'm like... Yeah. Though, I will admit, though, this is a really bad tangent, because it's not related to that, but it is. Mm -hmm. um, you will get used to the heat over time. Um, not that I'm saying that's why things should happen. I'm not saying that's why I take the bad <laughs> tangent. But, but you will notice the first time you get out, if you haven't suited a lot, the first time you start to suit, it is ungodly hot. And most people are just... This is my first weekend, so I'm like... Uh... A lot of people, it, it is overwhelming. At least, because I... It's been a long time now, I guess. I'm, I'm dating myself. Wicked! Mm -hmm. I am officially old now. I was never supposed to get old. But eventually, you too, everyone gets old. Um, my first time doing this... Which, <laughs> I started doing this like 14, 15 years ago now. But when I first started doing this, um, it was one of those things where it was just... This is just so crazy. You maybe 20 minutes at best. Oh, yeah, I guess I'm wrong. Well, if you want to get really technical, like, like I got my first pursuit when I was like five, because my aunt made me a cat costume when I was like a little kid. Do you remember back to that, though? I can actually remember wearing it, but it was Halloween. That doesn't count. So we were out trick or treating, and it was cold. Oh, no, I wore it all the time. After that. Like, I got it for Halloween, and I pretty much wore it all the time until Christmas time. And then my mom would not let me wear it anymore because I was freaking out of relatives. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so and now we know where it comes like, started. In, in, any time that I could, any time that we were going out where I wasn't going to get in trouble for it, yeah. I would wear it. And it drove her crazy. And then the next year I attached, like, I made a Thai beanie baby tank and attached it to the ear and I was a beanie baby so that she would stop getting freaked out. Nice. <laughs> so what you're saying is you, you find you were able to adjust to the heat and you, you learn to get used to it. You, you do. I, I find I did, most people I know have, um, actually just becomes a part of the thing, it, it, that, that urban lore of suiting because we just know that we're all going to be stupidly hot and... We I've already seen that a couple a couple times I've been in a suit. It, it, I was able to do it longer each time. Yeah. But the weird thing I've noticed over the years is just the, the heads in particular that have all the open space inside will typically get hotter than the ones that are much more close fitting. Really? Because it's just there's less dead air inside there. There's much more just circulation because there's less dead air, I guess is the best way to put it. So... I... I'm not sure. I will freely admit my own inexperience, but I'm not altogether certain I agree yeah. with that. I, my own first suit head, head didn't have a whole lot, lot of empty space in it I, either, but I can stand wearing it for more than a few minutes. Well, a few minutes is maybe a little bit low, but I understand it definitely would get hot. It, it still does get hot, so even after you've had it for a while, it's not like it suddenly becomes not hot. It is hot. You just get used to you it. You just get used to it. it. It's the, oh well, here we go again, kind of thing. Yeah. Yep. Rain and outdoor events. Usually oh, with me, yeah. I just say, only if it's not going to rain. Yeah. Um, we had made the mistake, at least in a few years past, that when it rained, we just kept going. And uh, we were troopers, and we were done for it. So... It was really dumb. Um, you can't obviously predict the weather, and especially in the Northwest, it does whatever it does, whenever it feels like it. And it's pretty so random. you normally do that and just say, only if it's not going to rain? Well, and that, that's something you maybe set expectations with a lot of the organizers. Most, of, most public events that you're going to, um, if it rains, they're probably going to cancel them or do something with them anyway. They do. So at least where I'm in the Midwest, if it rains at all, um, there's always the expectation of thunder and lightning, and so everything just gets <laughs> shut down. So be aware of where you're setting up your change space because if it rains there, that's all the water's going to go. Big. <laughs> you're right, and that's like another consideration actually with the change space. Actually, that's where we got burned. We were setting our tents up in 
eventual the tunnels. They weren't tunnels when it had, when we got there, but after the rain happened, the tent actually was the lowest part. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we had like a the way to go back in time and maybe redo it, we'd change that. But and that's that is definitely a consideration, understanding that yeah, it could potentially rain. Um, and to be safe. Um, and again, if you are in a place where you are going to get thunder and lightning for a million reasons, you probably don't want to be out there. Though so you're probably not conducting a lot of electricity. At least in the Midwest, though, if you were anything more than six feet tall, you were probably the tallest thing out there, so. <laughs> it's something to mention, too, at our events that we uh, added some clothing and things to protect our suits in public. To keep oh, them all right. And why did we do that, actually? See, so, yeah, so the characters, the suits face themselves. Face, face. Yes, it's like the, the, the kids come over at, at these events, and they'll give your suit a big hug, and then they leave, and you get like a shroud of turn print on your stomach. <laughs> so the kids face kind of stays there. So we ended up putting... Uh, jerseys on, basically over the characters, which and did two like things. Too. It made the group look very professional, which I think is the most amazing thing you can do. I, it, it's oh man, human psychology is spectacularly fascinating. You can take a group that is seen as creepy and weird, and as long as everybody suddenly shows up with the same type of uniform, the same type of clothing, and you have this pseudo organizational structure, you go from creepy and weird to oh okay, you're right, you're you got things covered. <laughs> And it's, it just, it's a, the most subversive thing, and I think it's absolutely spectacular. We, that's what, one of the reasons we did it. So we would all show up to these events in Vancouver, um, charity events and whatnot. We all had these navy blue jerseys on. All the spotters had navy blue t-shirts on with logos on them, and it looked like a uniformed group of people. And it just, you, the respect that you got, people understood that you were here to do something. It wasn't just a bunch of folks out there. Well, if you're not trying to be, you know, professional, if you're just trying to go out and do a public furry event, yeah, you can still do little things like that. Like, yes, you could have a group T-shirt. Like, I know uh, Fur Life up here in Seattle has T-shirts. Like, if half the people there are wearing Fur Life T-shirts, and it all looks like you're together. You mm -hmm. can get like for suits, you can get like a bandana yep. to wear on the arm of your suit, or yep. big ones to go on your neck or something like that. You don't have to wear like a whole thing if you don't want to cover your suit up, or if your suit doesn't isn't conducive to that. Totally agree. Well, it, it does. It, it, it adds a little bit of perceived formality, which I think gives you some get out of jail for freeze when things happen. <laughs> I don't know. Because not everyone's going to behave themselves necessarily, but you get a couple of mulligans, maybe, is a better way of putting it. Well, it does, uh, again, the psychology of it's important because it creates the illusion that um, all those other people that are wearing those similar shirts and such around you are part of your group effort. Yeah. So it will provide some safety if you had. You know, say you go bowling and you've got yes. that one group of belligerent drunk, drunk college students <clears throat> on the lane next to you who think it's going to be fun to just come over and beat up on the mascots. Yep. If they can tell that, oh, wait a minute, there's 30 other people there with the same shirt on, maybe the odds are not in my favor here. That's true. Yeah. On the other hand, being drunk doesn't usually allow for that kind of reasoning. <laughs> it, <laughs> Too big. It, it may have, it may have <laughs> a better effect on their friends who would... But Hopefully look, be the one when you're drunk, away. you can still see a mass of the same color. That's true. And be aware that there is more of this color than there is of my color-ish thing. <laughs> sort of yeah, like <laughs> <laughs> oh. Good job, Lou. You know, I'm sorry. I got nothing. <laughs> um, Nick here. Cleaning your suits is also very important when you go to these public events. I know it sounds like a no-duh. Um, but you show up in a really, really stinky suit is just not going to do you What's well. What's that line of the CSI fun? Well marinated? Yeah, well, and that's, a, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I wasn't going to mention CSI pretty much ever, but thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it, it, little things, like, you may not even recognize it. So I've actually, and I'm not, I'm not advocating this because if it doesn't work well, I'm not going to get in trouble for it. Um, I actually will bleach my fursuits. And I will bleach my fursuits because fur is not fabric, fur is plastic. And fur does not bleach. But fur will, if you bleach a fursuit, if you have any funk in it at all, it will absolutely get plonked out. So you can just wash them too. You can wash them, but the problem is if you have ever gone from a con, so for example, if you're at Anthrocon and you live way out here, and say United Airlines, because it's on camera, right? United Airlines <laughs> never loses bags ever. Never. No. Neither Except does Delta. Of course, you're flying on them, then they lose your bags. Um, but if they've ever lost your bags and it ends up being routed somewhere else and it takes a couple days to get there, but you've just left the con. And you've got the next Yeah, or even still, but in those couple days, because after the con's in July, and most of the U.S. is kind of toasty in July, 
Um, you are going to get really, really weird building growing in your fursuit. Oh, really? Salt, water, warmth, cool, moist area. It's a dish. <laughs> so I'm officially driving like everywhere. <laughs> so, but actually, I'm sitting in the back of your car, same issue, right? And I had that happen right. actually with my suit back sure. last sure. year. Um, <laughs> it just, it, and you didn't even realize it. It just, it, it, it grows slowly over time. You wash it, you freeze, and you're like, what the hell does that smell? You're like, you're, I don't stink. The suit really stinks. And then you start to see it suddenly, like it was at FCN uh, in Detroit earlier this year, and pulled the suit out of my bag, and it was just brown on the inside part of it, and I guess the mildew had just grown over the year or so, even though it's washed, because water's not going to kill that stuff. Pop in the washing machine with some bleach, gone clean, no problem. So, and I make suits, so I don't mind if I screwed it up, I'm just like, yeah, up, and you do it again. You have to be more careful if you've got, like, airbrushing and stuff on your... Yes. Because yeah, that's not going to be color pressed in your fabric or your... I would argue in a lot of cases, airbrushing, you probably don't want to put your suit in the washing machine anyway, because the agitation can just push it out of the fibers. You probably want to wash it in a tub. Um, but if there's no airbrushing, I bleach my suit a ton of times. I just do it to clean it up. Even spandex. Oddly enough, if you take a suit like this shirt, if I throw it in the wash with bleach, we'll probably not have any issues with it. It hasn't so far. Because again, it's not fabric. It's plastic. Only have, yeah. You can put a little bit of bleach, goes a long way, and yes. color safe bleach is as its name states, relatively color safe yes. most things. Um, but that, that typically will get out of the funk that will magically and mysteriously appear um, if you ever had your suit lost by United Airlines because you might never lose these bags unless I'm using them. But more importantly, <laughs> the only place that you're ever expected to have a suit that smells funky is maybe at the dance. Yeah, if you're But everybody else public, smells funky, so it's kind of hard to tell. That's a good point. Everyone's been in a suit all day by that point, and it's like... I suppose by the end of a fur con, it's not unusual to expect some funk around. But if you're going out in public, yes, they, they, there is, there's no better way to creep out. I mean, you, you will see the sour face on the kid, and then you will see the totally disgusted parents. Well, and it's, uh, the other consideration, though, and that's another reason again, spotters, spotters, spotters. You may not realize I'm the worst. I sweat really ridiculously bad. Like after the dance, it, it was like I was in a shower, except it was. Really not a shower. <laughs> Actually, it didn't smell. It was just really wet. And you don't know when you're having fun with kids. You give that kid a hug. Yeah. And literally, you drown the kid as he's going. <laughs> <laughs> you get to just give yeah. a hug. Maybe you don't want to be doing that. Oh no, doggy needs to stand over here for a bit. Wet doggy. So I typically will bring a couple changes of shirts if I'm doing a public appearance because if you're out there all day, you're probably going to go through all of them. Um, the external jersey is fun for that too because uh, when we had white. When we used white cotton like shirts, they would get wet and show and the wet look, t-shirt contest. It looked really it. bad. <laughs> the nice thing about having a dark navy that's all, you know, synthetic material is you will still I mean if someone's getting that soaked in suit that it's starting to soak into the jersey, yeah. A it's a protective layer between you and whoever's hugging you, but B and it, it helps you it helps dry itself easier. But you yeah. will see darker spots even on the dark fabric, which yeah. gives your spotters you sweat all the way through your suit and your jersey, yeah. it's time to quit. <laughs> <laughs> that water needs to be replenished at the very least. Yeah. Um, Zazzle, by the way, I found those, those jerseys are pretty cheap. Zazzle.com. Right. How do you spell that? Z-A-Z-Z-L-E. That's right. I said Z, or in, they may be Z. Z. No more Z for me. <laughs> Zazzle.com. Anyway, just... Those are the things that you, you want to be considering. I, we had a lot of problems actually when we started doing the public stuff in Vancouver because it was literally right after the CSI stuff. And so <laughs> there were a number of events when we were calling around way back in the day where the response was, oh, you no, you that, no. And so that's why we started trying to create this professional image on the exterior, got incorporated, splashed the incorporation on the website, everyone was wearing the same uniforms when we were out in public because you try to create this air of yeah, they may do that, but that's not us. We're professional, we do this kind of thing. Um, and you're right, even at bowling events and things like that, if you're wearing a t-shirt from your local fur community, it's that perception that sometimes buys you the ability to go do that stuff. I also find it's odd, when, again, not a rule necessarily, but I have noticed through observation that when the group is wearing stuff like that, I actually find the group is less likely to do really, really stupid things because it's very blatant that you're rep you're representing something. Yeah. 
Right. Well, yeah. Because <laughs> you're not peer pressure. Right? Exactly, peer pressure. So things like that. Yeah, so they actually, so if, for example, the bowling meets we have in Chicago are ridiculous. I mean, there's like 150 people show up to bowl. So they actually have like con badges now to go bowling. And they found as people started to have badges to go bowling, the incidence of idiocy went down significantly because you're not wearing something, you paid the dollar or whatever to go, and it just made their made a lot easier for fun for everybody. So, again, things like that. Um, I told a story about Lace. I mean, that first suitor from Vancouver who was screwing with the cops on Halloween on Grand Hill. <laughs> Not a good idea. You can, uh, an, an important thing to restate, especially if you have new people coming into your group, because I know that as the, uh, for, like, just for reactivity, people call uh, the Helping Cause group really into this, and we are, and we're very proud of that because yeah. of who we serve, but we like, but we also like to go to furry events where it's less structured and we don't have to, where we're not there only to serve the other people, we're there to have fun and enjoy being furry, which is what most people want to do at a furry event, so those are two very different things, so you don't have to go form a formal group to go yep. perform in public, It's I think it's awesome that there are so many fur groups that are growing in, in larger cities and even smaller ones, so that you have a support network of people to go out and do things in public, people just love that. Yeah. The, the important thing is, um, if you're part of one of those groups now, um, I suppose even if you're joining, but if you're part of one of those groups now, make a point to say something to new people who join or new members who come into that community. And even if it's just five minutes to yeah. take somebody aside at the beginning and say, I enjoy doing this and this is important to me and Don't this, and yeah, this yes. is the fun that we get to have when we do it right. And you, you, don't, you, you don't have to make a negative thing out of it. You just have to make sure that they own part of the positive influence that you can have. Because if they, if they feel that belonging and that ownership, then they'll come along and have fun. If it's somebody who you really have to waggle the finger at, especially if you have to do it repeatedly, mm -hmm. again, yelling at them and saying, you're screwing this up for us, it's not going to help anything. But helping them understand that one mistake just one mistake out in public in the park doing something stupid or wrong yeah. can earn you the ban hammer from the cops, the city, the you know the community organization that runs the park, you know the owners who run the bowling alley. I mean, they'll either love you or hate you, and we, we've seen examples of both all over the country. You know, yeah. some people have really screwed it up and and it kind of fractures their community. So if you care about the community and you care about being able to be involved in those activities, then you well, know, don't be don't be selfish about getting to enjoy being part of the community. So again, my observation is uh, the people that typically will cause problems, especially here if they're in suit in public, we'll talk about this during the performance stuff itself, are oftentimes acting out because they can't think of better ways to express themselves or to perform, so they do really weird things and dumb things because that's how it stands out. Um, so finding out ways and, and maybe looking at people who do perform well in public and helping to show new people, you know, no, don't punch people because you think that's funny, or no, don't go do this because you think it's funny. Try using, you know, a bowling ball as a prop, or pie, try use. I don't know, maybe bowling ball's not a good idea. <laughs> but, uh, you don't know, punch them, because a bowling ball is much yeah. more effective. One of things are beach ball, was it? Well, or something. Different. Use some sort of a prop to assist you, or use some sort of a, a technique, or guide these people towards ways to be able to perform. And typically, that's, that's why they're really acting out, because they just want attention, we all kind of do. Um, and in lieu of knowing some better way to do it, they typically that's what I've observed, because I've seen people who were total asshats when they first started doing this stuff, slowly develop and do public performances and start to build a character and start to become better performers, suddenly behave in you know, greater progression. They are less difficult in public, they cause less problems, because all they were really trying to do is act out to get attention, and if they can do that in a more positive way, they're not going to get kicked out of a bowling alley, for example. What about furry is not inherently about getting attention? <laughs> Why? Well, exactly. Well, <laughs> one way or another. The mere fact that you're going to dress up like something like that and not expect attention is sometimes funny. I'm just going to go wear this giant suit and hang in the corner so no one sees me. <laughs> <laughs> what? If that's your goal, to stay home. <laughs> that would be kind of creepy too, like this giant animal. That's true. 
Something we get asked a lot too, and that's something your spotters need to know is what is your group? Why are they there? What do they represent? Because you're going to get asked. That is, you know, yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. And they're usually people from other events at these events. Well, and again, so again, kudos to Anthrocon. Um, they have probably, in, again, I've worked at a few cons, I've done this for a long time. I think they have probably the clearest and one of the best media strategies because it is a very concise set of things. If, if you are on staff and you are talked to, by, to the media, first of all, you either try to get somebody else to speak who's designated to do so, but at the very least, these are the things you must make sure are communicated. Love the city. We're very, very grateful for all the help. We're a community that does charity work. Give everybody the bullet point. These are the things that need to come out in conversation so everybody's on message. And that's the thing that you want to have at the events as well. Is make sure everybody who's there as a spotter understands those basics. What are you doing? Why are you here? Why should I care? What's so nice about it? That kind of stuff. And people who say stupid stuff out of suit aren't necessarily going to say it because they want to give a bad impression, they'll say, I don't know. I got one just died. Oh, no, he's moving. It's good. It's good. They'll, it's good. they'll say good. stupid things because they don't know what to say. Correct. Yes. How, how many people here are prepared? Like, if you had to just walk out on the street right now and a TV crew walked up to you and said, what is this? Would you have a coherent and prepared answer that you Tornado gun going to wreck up our house. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I find uh, pretty much when I run into somebody else, my stuttering comes out. Yeah. I, it, it's, I do some marketing stuff maybe for my real job. So, but as a part of that, that, those are the things you typically want to be doing. Is everybody who's speaking, it, you give them bullet points. You don't give them a speech because you stutter if you try to remember the speech. But you give them the bullet point. You're thinking in your head, okay, four or five key things I have to remember that have to come out in conversation. You don't need to get them all. But it gives you some subject lines and some directions to talk about, and it makes sure that you are not having to invent things on the spot. So, I wish furries in general we had like cue cards we could carry and go, you know, sci fi convention, charity auction, people from all over, it's a you know, worldwide convention, that kind of thing. Just carry everybody... like a sign. If you, if you don't talk in soup, carry like a sign with the explanation on exactly. it or something. Just right write it all out. And again, never tell people what you're not. You never say what we aren't. You always tell people what you are. Don't say we are not at whatever convention. No. Marketing is not about not, it's about what you are. Yeah. It's about promoting the positive, not yes. expressing the negative. Even if you, you acknowledge the negative, you may be potentially introducing an objection. No, no, even, no, if no. You have no, even if you have nothing to say or are uncomfortable saying something, that's fine too. Just yes. smile. Just smile and say no comment, or smile and say, you know, thank you and have a great day. Some of the know, funniest things I've seen. You don't have to answer, just smile and walk away. Some of the funniest things I've seen, if you're in suit and somebody comes over to interview you with a TV camera, if you try to talk but you're pantomiming as you're talking, you do the hmm, 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 and you're like acting it out but you're not saying anything. If either they laugh because it's funny or they give up and walk away, but either way you're, you're safe. I mean, more often than not, you're they're going to laugh. Exactly. More often than not, they're going to laugh. I think because they know you can't talk but you're trying to make a joke of the fact that you can't talk sort of a sign language with your spotters or some sort of a code so they understand because you can't always speak to them even if you are okay speaking in suit oftentimes they may not be able to hear you so you know time out what time is it I'm done that kind of stuff you want to develop some sort of a, a sign language in advance of you going out with your spotter so that they know what's going on um, and like in a lot of cases if you're suddenly mobbed by a bunch of kids what are you doing Thumper? You're, yeah your hand is up Spotters are looking over, going, oh, that's not good. I'll go over and take a look at that. Because again, if you've got 10 performers and six spotters, they're trolling around. The hand up is a way of saying, you know, please, something's going down over here. I need some help. I was under a pile of children where the only thing I could do was get my hand out of the butt. That's right. may have been where that signal came from. I think it was like one of our first years at the Fringe. <laughs> And I, I literally got mobbed yeah. by a group of small children outside one of those theater rooms, and yeah. I was on the bottom of a pile of, literally, like a yeah. football pile of children. The only thing I could do <laughs> Worst is get my it. hand out, <laughs> and at some point, someone spotted that my paw was sticking out of these children. There's an arm under that mob of children. <laughs> they come oh, and put your hand in whistling dead ball, <laughs> start peeling people up. <laughs> First down. <laughs> Flag on the plane. Thumper down. Seahawks win. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I get the Packers. I it's fine. <laughs> Bears and Packers. It's a legendary. I'm the correct answer. I know. 
Um, so let's see here. We only have a few minutes left. Questions? Any questions about anything? We are doing it. The performance, the character for your character panels on one block, probably even in here. Yeah, yeah that's in the suit. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in here. room by Jeff Jack. Is that you too? It is actually, yeah. But I'll be in the suit more, so it'll be. Oh my god, man. Uh, what? Are you going to crash my panel? Yeah. <laughs> I was going to be in the suit, but then I went to Panera. That is not the same thing at all. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you, Buzzy. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions about it? Say you have a group of people that want to start getting involved in doing this and getting into events. Uh, yeah. What methods would you use to, to help get in there? Well, so it depends on the type of events you're looking to do. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking to do charity events and things of that nature, um, I would designate somebody probably as a lead within your social group, uh, only because you probably want a single point of contact or maybe two. Mm -hmm. um, try again bullet point a list of things that you would want to express to them, reasons why they should let you, basically why you're selling to them, why you should be involved in that. Um, maybe even for your first time, write up a quick blurb that you would read over the phone just to try and have them involved. Maybe create websites or things like that to help the organization look more formal. Um, well, what, just like you're asking, which, which direction are you, would you like to go? You personally, would you like to? Oh, me oh no, I'm, I actually do this already. I'm just doing this for, to, for other people. But well, something we do is we also have a portfolio of pictures and, and old video that, have, that we have done at previous uh, outings and stuff. And we, we show that to them. And it's like, this is what we can bring to your event. You know, which, the hardest part yeah. seems to be the breakout. Yeah. Get, actually getting started. Because mm -hmm. once we, I mean, we only solicited, what, three maybe events total before once we had shown up, the people who were at those events, yeah. I mean, that even this year, what, 10 years later, how many uh, unsolicited requests? We have three this year. Out of two events, the first two events of the year, we had three more yeah. people who attended those going, we've been here, we've seen you before, we love you, will you come to our group thing yeah. this month and this month and this month? And so it just keeps stacking up. Yeah. Um, so that that's months. not the hard part. The hard part is the breakout. The, yes. How do you make that first contact? And if you don't already have a portfolio of, you know, pictures or things you've done to demonstrate that, mm -hmm. I think the, the key is going to be the organization yeah. and the approach. You really do have to have some uh, professional organization together before you do it, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right. Enough groups have done this. Um, I mean, I've had at least two other groups who have just emailed me and said, "How did you know? What do your bylaws and rules for helping cause look like? How do you select your membership? How do you recruit people? You know, have you kicked people out and why?" And and so then you then you don't have to learn cold. You can take a list from other groups who have done it, yeah. and maybe take a few different groups who have done it and say, "What what are the things that have worked best for you? Getting started and maintaining." And just make the best all of those. I say, and or using those groups even as a reference. So if you get a you know, oh, yeah. people like mm -hmm. by the bay, for example, yeah. or helping pause, use them as a reference when you talk. Just say, I work with these guys. This is stuff they did. We're doing the same thing here. And I think it's a great way to do this. Well, but you're right. Yeah. It's that first breakout that is just a pain in the butt. And that as long as they're organized and they're executed well. A lot of communities, these volunteers, it's a small world. They will volunteer at other events in the city, and they will see you and want to have you there as well. So, so it's a big part of that is networking, too. So it doesn't hurt. I know one group um, somewhere in the Midwest has started doing charity work. They started with one of the members, their sister, worked for, like, the, the Diabetes Foundation or whatever. So they said, hey, can we go and just do your event that's coming up? Yep. That was their first. So now you have something official on the resume. But you use a personal connection to get in and do that, and that's very helpful too, if, especially if you don't know other connections. Because, yeah. like I said, once it starts, you're talking to the organizer or the PR person for these different groups, and they often work for other groups or with other groups because charity organizations talk too. They don't want to reinvent the wheel. They all need help, you know, growing. No, so. I, you, I get you, the, the whole point with the bullet points, the whole point with the references, the whole point with the portfolio, that's a great idea, by the way, um, is you're trying to build a picture in the other person's head of what you're going to bring to the event. You're trying to make sure that they think in their head, is the risk of these people really screwing things up really low? Do I feel comfortable that they're bringing something to this event that is going to be reputable, that's going to really make us better for it? And again, the more you can do to make that happen, whether it is a reference, whether it's uh, materials, whether it's videos, things like that that show you're not just a group of people out there 
causing problems, the better. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and there are tangible examples of these things available if you talk to other groups. Oh yeah. I mean, it's we're talking in abstracts here, and I know the most helpful thing there. You know, everybody wants a plan, not just elect me and I'll fix everything. If you <laughs> The, there, there are specific tangible things you can you can demonstrate and talk to other groups about what those are. I'll, and I will give you a specific example. There is a hospice foundation that we worked with, have worked with for uh, eight, well, we figure eight or nine year, ninth year, I think this year. When we started with them, they were in a different place. They had you know twenty people there. They were making two to three thousand dollars off of their fundraising. Yeah. This last year, there was. Um, maybe 150, 180 people there, so it's, what, 10 times as big as when it started, and they raised almost $25,000. Uh -huh. And the reason why they have so many people coming back is because it's a family organization. The families and the kids drive the participation and the competition between the fundraising groups, and they have straight up come to us and said, we would not be doing this well, we would not be making this money if it weren't for you, because the parents are the ones who don't like dragging their children back to community charity fundraising events every year. But when the kids have seen you year after year at the same event, and that consistency becomes important, when you've been at that same event two, three years in a row, the kids are dragging the parents back to those fundraising events, and event organizers love that, oh, yeah. because then they don't have to figure out how to do it. Why do you think those groups bring in a bounce house and a band and yep. a clown? They want the kids to want to come back, and characters are a huge attraction. We make it freaking Disneyland for a little community organization who otherwise would only be able to bring the clown or the base paint. Yep. So that's a huge impact that translates to thousands of dollars or more for that organization, and that is the point of their fundraising effort. Keep in mind what the goal of the community organization is that you're serving. You're there to help them be successful. When we go to that event, we're not there to show off how cool our characters are or how fun we are at performing. We're there because that group needs to pull in ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars, or they can't keep a bed open. They can't keep volunteer nurses equipped to go help people in their community. That's what the goal we're trying to achieve. We just bring a unique talent to that. I could I can't even say that any better. And so I won't. Thank you. You're right, you're right <laughs> the life. You really are. It, it's not about you when you do these types of events, it's about the event. Um, also, methods of getting discovered. Now you take what's known as a completely open to the community event, like mm -hmm. procession of the species that we do in Olympia. Mm -hmm. You know, where they want to just get the community involved not registered, you show up, what element are you going to portray, you get in that group of people, and mm -hmm. that's a method of getting discovered. Yeah. Yeah, if you, if you have set up your group already, and you've got, you know, a website, you've got some pictures of who your characters are, maybe you don't even, maybe you haven't even done an event yet, so you don't have any history or portfolio to put up there, you can just put who your characters are, make up some funny bios for them, make them interesting, and then you get your, your t-shirt and your logo up there, and then go do a, an open to public event like that. There's going to be a few people who say, boy, i got to go look at that website and find out what in the heck that is. Yeah. Except it doesn't work for profession of the species, since one of the rules are no written words. Uh, okay. And that gets rid of all the politicians. Get, get a really, 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 really easy URL and just pantomime it. <laughs> Go ahead, QR code. Yeah. And you put oh, QR code into your QR code. Airbrush QR codes right on there. We got airbrush QR codes mm. on the suits. That's interesting. Who's not going to come I'm up and scan that. your belly if they see a QR code? <laughs> <laughs> Who's not going to want to know where that goes? That's actually some sort of a code so they understand.